Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to bring you our insights on password vaults and password manager products. Last week, we talked about evil jinx and some protection against that. One of the things we didn't mention as part of our defense against evil jinx is a password vault. And the reason why a password vault is effective against something like that is if you remember, we mentioned that Evil Jinx requires a domain to be registered that is similar to the domain of the real site, but is not actually the domain. So, for example, like Google with G00GLE.com versus G-O-O-G-L-E.com. When you have a password vault, it stores the URL of the site along with your username and password. So one of the things that could trigger your spidey sense if you click on a link and it goes to a site that is not in your password vault, it won't autofill your username and password like you would expect it to. So that's something different. And that's why a password vault can be an effective defense against an evil jinx attack. Another thing that happened lately was LastPass one of the more popular password vaults on the market released that they are changing their free tier. LastPass is one of those products that have a free tier and then it also has a paid tier. They're changing their free tier to only allowing a user to have the vault either on a mobile device or on a desktop browser. So there was a lot of people who were upset about this. And so I think it's timely to maybe do a little bit of comparison on password vaults. The three that we're going to kind of do a a little bit of a comparison on is LastPass, 1Password, and Bitwarden. There's obviously a lot of different products out there. A lot of them are very similar. These three are probably the more popular ones. They all have enterprise versions, they all um, have a paid tier. LastPass and Bitwarden have free tiers. One password is paid only. So we wanted to do this comparison because, again, this is a podcast for security defenders for enterprises. These are all enterprise versions that you can get for your company. So... Going into it, the first thing that they have is an import. So if you're transferring passwords from a specific product previously, or most likely you're transferring from the built-in vaults from browsers like Chrome or Firefox or Edge, and you install their product, they can natively import all the passwords and usernames that you have associated with your browser password vault into this vault, which is really nice. They also have ways to transfer from one product to another. So if you're moving from LastPass to 1Password or 1Password to Bitwarden, they have ways to transfer that export from their product and import to another product, which is really nice. It really stinks when there's a password vault that doesn't allow you to export and import. And these all have that function. Another thing that I just want to put up front as well as part of the security, all three use something called a password-based key derivation function. This is a password strengthening algorithm that essentially makes it harder for someone to brute force your master password. The way password vaults work is that you have one master password to unlock the vault, and then you have your username and passwords within the vault. And they all use this password-based key derivation function. And how that works is it has different iterations where it will 
change the number of rounds that it will iterate itself so that it makes it harder for someone to brute force it. The higher the number of rounds, the less number of guesses per second will it allow a attacker to brute force that password. You can read about each one of them on their sites. They all have a default value that is set when you create the account on how many rounds and iterations of this password-based key derivation is. What I do like about Bitwarden and LastPass is that they allow you to change that value. You generally don't want to change it a lot, but if you know the value, a really, really smart targeted attack may be able to narrow their attack down. It just kind of strengthens the more paranoid folks if they have a custom number of rounds that you can iterate versus just the base and default value. So one password just has a default value, whereas Bitwarden and LastPass allow you to change to a custom value for that password base key derivation. And for those tinfoil hat folks out there listening, I, I should point out that with current technology, once you start to get beyond like 10, 11 characters for a password, if it is, you know, ostensibly random-ish at least, we, we start to get into the, the very, very, very long time frames to brute force it, where we're talking, you know, years, if not decades, very quickly. I know um, one password's kind of default behavior for the master password is to take a whole bunch of dictionary words and append four of them together. So your one password, master password length by default with just the default behavior is going to be well north of 20 characters. So even with the most advanced cracking rig you can build, your your ability to brute force that is, is still measured in many, 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 many years. So if, if you're following good practices, you know, probably not a huge concern, but again, for, for folks that want to have the ability to control and modify it, it's there. Yeah. One password has a document on their website that goes over how long it would take using a four GPU system and the number of iterations versus your password strength in bits. So if you had like a 65 bit password strength with en entropy with a 45,000 iteration, it would take 66,000 guesses per second to try to get your password and it would take uh, roughly 6.7 million years to get it using current technology with a four GPU system. So fairly long time. <laughs> and we always have to say current until, so when uh, quantum computing comes out, somebody goes back and listens to our podcast and goes, ha ha ha. It doesn't take that long anymore suckers, but current tech. Yeah. It's, it's not in your lifetime. So one password also has this really nice default system that I like. LastPass and Bitwarden, when you first create a user, you obviously have a username and password. You can go and set up MFA after the fact, but it's not default. With one password, they have this secret key that also gets generated for each account, which is automatic. And when you sign into a new device, you have to provide that username, the password, and the secret key. And then on top of that, you can still enable MFA. So when I sign into a new device, I have to do all of the above, username, password, secret key, plus my MFA token. You don't have to do the MFA, you know, that's optional, just like with LastPass and Bitwarden. But it is nice that you have this secret key that's just kind of automatic. And then on a daily basis, when you have to sign in to the uh, extension or your app, you're just using your password. Of course, you still want to have a strong master password, even though it comes with the secret key. It's just on new devices 
you have to put in the secret key. For existing devices, if an attacker were to get your device, they obviously wouldn't have to have the secret key. They would just need your password or username and password. For geolocations, I had mentioned in one of our previous episodes that LastPass allows you to essentially gate the login in certain ways. You could do it in one way where I don't want logins to my LastPass account occurring from certain countries. Say I want to block Russia or Ukraine or North Korea or something like that. I could also do it the other way where I say I only want logins from the United States. And we've kind of gone over the pros and cons of doing a geolocation fence essentially for those logins because with VPN, people could just use a VPN and egress out of the United States and still have a United States IP to log in from. In fact, when I traveled, I sometimes forgot to set the geolocation to the country that I was going to. So I would have to actually VPN back to the United States in order to access my last pass vault. So I circumvented my own security control. <laughs> nice. With one password, they have something called a travel mode, which is unique to that particular password vault solution. Essentially, if you're traveling and you're in transit, the idea is if you, your devices may not be in your control if you have to go through customs or maybe you're checking the device and if that device is outside of your control, you may have to wipe the passwords that are on it. Or if you're going through customs, maybe they force you to unlock your password vault. You can put all of your secrets that you need for a specific travel requirement, only the things that you need while in transit into a specific vault, then put your whole account under travel mode and only the secrets within the vault that is marked for travel will appear. So you don't have to necessarily delete things or sign out or anything like that. You just move the secrets that you need to a specific vault and then put the whole account in their travel mode. With Bitwarden, they don't really have any travel mode and they don't really have any way to geo restrict logins. So it's kind of, um, two features of the different other solutions that are unique to them. There's something that we may have mentioned on our previous shows as well called the temporary one-time passwords. Adam, do you want to talk about how these solutions have a way to generate those or store those? Yeah, so there's a standard for the generation of one-time passcodes. And you've probably become pretty accustomed to it because if you use something like Google Authenticator or Authy or um, Microsoft Authenticator supports this now as well, it's where whenever you're setting up MFA on a, on a site, they give you a QR code, you scan it with your phone, and all of a sudden it starts spitting out six-digit codes that recycle through like every 30 seconds. And, and most of us probably listening to this show are familiar with that. And so a couple of these solutions like Bitwarden and 1Password, and LastPass does, but only in their enterprise version apparently, uh, support the ability to import those one-time passwords, passcodes, into the vault right alongside like your username, your password, and then your one-time passcode. They're all right there. And Andy and I kind of had an interesting discussion about this because certainly from a usability perspective, and Tanya Jenka mentioned this when we had her on the show a couple weeks ago, from usability perspective, it's awesome. You put in your username, your password uh, that you fill through the vault, and then it automatically puts your one-time passcode on the clipboard. So you click sign in, it pops up the prompt, you push control V or command V, and you're off to the races. And it's amazing. But then there becomes the question of, Kind of the purpose of that is is supposed to be that it's some sort of other device. It's some sort of other thing, other factor that you're validating. And you're essentially kind of putting those all in, you know, one place. 
So certainly from a like diversity of storage methods or diversity of devices, you have less when you do this. But is that really that important in, in this case when you're using a password vault already? What benefit are you getting from having MFA turned on if you're doing that? I, I mean, it's an interesting conversation. And Andy, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I actually tweeted this out to one password a few weeks ago and they replied and there's an article which I'll link to it in our show notes where they talk about TOTP or the temporary one-time passcodes versus MFA or 2FA. And when you store your MFA token, essentially, let's say you enable MFA for a site and you store it within the same place that you have your username and password, it's technically not MFA anymore. It, you, you have TOTP, which still, I think, is a higher standard of security than just having your username and password. But it is slightly less than true MFA. I think there are definitely use cases for situations where you can store this. One, it's really nice, like you mentioned, Adam, for convenience that it is all stored in one place. So for the casual user, having all of those keys in the same place in the browser extension, having it automatically copy onto your clipboard and, and being able to do it right there without having to pick up a device to check the code, type in the code, that is a huge benefit. And one of the enemies of security is complexity. So the simpler you can make it for the regular users, the better it's going to be. Second of all, one of the really, really nice use cases, and Adam and I do this as well, and I do it in my enterprise, uh, LastPass, is for shared accounts. One of the problems is with shared accounts, if you have MFA enabled for a shared account, someone's getting that code. Someone has to have it on their phone generally, or they get the text, and then you have to message that person and say, hey, what's the code? And they have to enter it in. With it stored in LastPass, and if you share that secret, then you have the TOTP right there. doesn't matter who gets to log in. You can enable MFA for the account and then have the TOTP right there. So I really like that. The other thing is backups of these codes. When you change a device, if you have your code stored somewhere else, then if you lose your device or if you change your device, you have to recover those codes. And if you don't have them backed up anywhere, then it'll probably be pretty difficult because you have to log into the account, you need your code, and you don't have your code. So having all of that in one spot, again, is a convenience. I wouldn't use TOTP for my master password for my last pa or for my last pass or for my one password or for any one of these like vaults. If I'm enabling MFA for the vault itself, I would store that MFA token in another solution like Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, one of those. But for other accounts, put them into your one password and that way you can recover it. There are other Solutions, like Adam said, with, with Microsoft Authenticator, with Authy, they do have cloud backups, a way to back it up and restore it. If you don't want to back it up to the cloud, which can be a security risk, one of the methods that I've heard that people use is when you enable MFA and you get the QR code, you print that off. And then you store a hard copy of it somewhere like in a safe. And then when you change your device or lose your device and you have to reset all those codes, you just take out the stack of QR codes and you start scanning them with your new phone. You know, it's just an interesting conversation because if you really get down and you think about it. So, so let's just use a theoretical example. I have a Twitter account and I have it stored in my one password vault. And so I have a generated password that is completely random, that is whatever the maximum password length supported by Twitter is. So it's, you know, it's long, let's say it's 32 characters, completely random. 
um, uppercase, lowercase, symbols, numbers, whatever. Okay, that, that password, again, we just kind of talked through this, it's not getting cracked by any reasonable method, right? I mean, short of somebody dumping the DB from Twitter and being able to do an offline attack on it, that password, my password is not getting compromised anytime soon. Now, I do have MFA enabled on Twitter because, you know, MFA all the things, so I have that turned on too, but I have the TOTP stored in one password right alongside the generated password. So ultimately, I guess, as I sit here even recording this show right now, I, I kind of ask out loud, what is that doing for me from a from that perspective? I mean, sh I, I guess there's the theoretical, if somebody found out a way to you know, bypass the password prompt or something for Twitter's authentication, but they couldn't break you know, the second factor, then maybe it protects me. But ultimately, am I just making more work for myself with no real security benefit? It's interesting to think out loud about it too. So um, certainly there's benefit, like if you reuse your password on a whole bunch of sites, if you at least turn on MFA, you give yourself a fighting chance when somebody does credential stuffing that they won't be able to get in. But if you're already doing all the right things with a password vault, I don't know how much incremental value that brings. I'm not going to stop doing it, but just as a as a theoretical kind of uh, thought experiment, it's it's interesting to kind of talk about out loud. I would say the risk is if your device becomes compromised and your one password vault is either unlocked or, or last pass or whatever your password manager is, is unlocked or you have a weak master password, mm -hmm. then they would have all of your accounts. Right. But in that case, you know, it, it, if you didn't have your device and you had MFA tokens on a separate device, then that would be a protection, but that would be the risk. And it's pretty small to be fair. Right. I mean, they, the attacker would have to have physical control of a device that already has a vault that's decrypted or they have your master password that can decrypt it that you've already signed in on. And then they would have the secrets, username and password, and then they have the TOTP alongside of it. Yeah. I mean, what I'm basically saying, Andy, is if you're if you're using a password vault, what does having the TOTP, if you're going to store it in the vault right alongside it, what is that really getting you? And and I guess my answer is not a whole heck of a lot. I mean, I do it, and, and now I'm kind of sitting here questioning it out loud if I really do need to kind of spread that back out. Um, because, yeah, it sure as heck is convenient, but man, at, at that point, it, it's not really much of an additional security control at all. It's just kind of a burden. I don't know. Yeah, it's. I think it's a nuance um, of where the convenience and security lie. I think for the majority of users, I'll, I'll use my wife as an example. When I, when I enabled MFA on a bunch of her accounts, I stored the MFA token within her one password vault. Mm -hmm. And that's for convenience. That way she has it right there. She doesn't have to go to her phone and, and enter it in. And she's, that's not a behavior she's used to for people mm -hmm. who don't use password vaults. And I think that is, kind of a failure of the security community in general. These products are not easy to use. I've been using them for years. And when I switched her over, it still took me, you know, an hour to two hours to help switch a bunch of her accounts over, change the passwords of her accounts, scan the MFA token, and even putting it into one password, you have to enter it in. And then you have to use your phone and modify the secret, scan the code within the one password vault. So it's not mm -hmm. like it's an intuitive thing, right? Like I, I know how to do it because I've done it, but if I were to tell her how to do it, it would take her, you know, half an hour for one thing, right? Right. So a lot of people think of these password vault solutions as just username and passwords for URLs but I use them for a lot more. I have backups of sensitive documents that I've scanned and uploaded PDF files of them as a secure note to my 1Password vault. I used LastPass previously. I'm currently a personal 1Password uh, person. My company uses LastPass, so I, I've, I've used them quite a bit. I, I have a free version of Bitwarden that I've tried out as well, but 
I use these not only for username and passwords, but I do copies of my power of attorneys, my medical power of attorney, my last will and testament, my birth certificates, my kids' birth certificates, digital copies of my passports, my driver's license, my social security card, all of that. If you're traveling and you may lose your passport, maybe a digital copy of this because hopefully you still have your phone. I mean, that would be a really, really bad day if you lost all of that. But, you know, at least you have a backup in case something happens on your phone. Same thing, I have a specific secret in there in case of emergency, it's basically called, and I have an emergency contact for unlocking the vault, and then they can follow the directions that I've laid out because my life is very digital. I think a lot of our lives are very digital, and if something were to happen, at least from my standpoint, all my stuff is locked down very, very tightly. So it'd be very difficult, at least in the short term, for someone to unlock all the things that I have. So I have an emergency contact. I have all the necessary documentation and I have directions within there that if something were to happen, this is the steps they will go through to recover. you do anything like that, Adam? Yeah, I, I take advantage of that capability quite a bit too. And it's, it's amazing how handy it is just to have things like social security numbers uh, easily available and, and driver's license numbers and that sort of thing. Just having it there at your fingertips when you need it, because it's amazing how many times you, you need to go grab that. And, and so to have it readily accessible is, is amazing. So absolutely, I'm a big fan of above and beyond just username and password, but all of the secure documents you can store in there. Cost is something that we can just briefly talk about. They all fairly are similar when it comes to cost. There's a little bit of price difference. We mentioned before that Bitwarden and LastPass have free tiers. And for Bitwarden, there's a couple of limitations in the free tier. They do allow you to have the app as well as browser extensions with their paid version. They give you that encrypted storage to upload documents. And then the TOTP, where we're storing that code, that's also part of their premium package. With LastPass, the recent change was you could either be a mobile user or you can be a user on the desktop and then they allow you to switch only so many times. I mean that it does kind of suck, but their point is probably to drive people to the paid version and then one password is paid only. So Bitwarden is $10 a year for personal one password and last pass are exactly the same at roughly $36 a year for a family version, and most of these products have a family version that allow up to five users, roughly, four to five users, depending on which one. Bitwarden is $40 a year, 1Password is $60 a year, and LastPass is $48 a year, which are pretty reasonable if you're sharing among a bunch of users. And then for enterprise, they all vary. Bitwarden is between 3 to $5 per user per month, and that's like if you have a small team, like a small business versus like a large enterprise licensing. So $3 per user per month for the smaller side, $5 per user per month for the, the enterprise version. One password is $4 and $8 respectively. The same thing, $4 per month per user for the small business and $8 per user per month for the, the large one. LastPass is, has three different enterprise tiers. They have a small business one, they have an enterprise version, and then they have something called Identity. It's four, six, and eight dollars per user per month, respectively. The eight dollar per month, the Identity one, that includes single sign-on. Essentially, they provide their own identity provider, and you can onboard apps into their identity provider and do single sign-on through LastPass. Essentially, so if that's something that you want or need you can use LastPass as, a, as an identity provider. I have a Eero 
mesh Wi-Fi system, and they have a paid offering called Eero Secure Plus. And one of the things it does is it gives you a whole bunch of ad filtering and ad blocking and blocking of malicious sites and threats and all that good stuff. And it's really nice. It's actually delivered, by the way, under the covers through Zscaler. It's pretty great tech and works really slick. I mean, it's literally just click a button. So if you want the easy button to secure your home Wi-Fi, love it. But one nice perk of that is that it includes a one password for family subscription as part of it. And so I believe the entire like Euro Secure Plus for a year is let's say a hundred bucks and one password for families is 60. And so right there, like two thirds of the cost, boom, something I was paying for anyways, I was able to roll that into to that offering. So, you know, check around. Um, if you if you use an Eero system, that's a great way to get a password manager and a good one, um, as well as some other nice benefits. But uh, there's sometimes you you might have access to password managers in other ways, um, whether they're bundled with some sort of security solution you use on your your computers or maybe your ISP provides it or something. You never know anymore because they they kind of throw them in, and there's actually a lot of value to be had. So check that out. And just a quick note on these three particular ones because I've used them all. I was a LastPass user for years. I recently switched to 1Password, and you may be asking why. <laughs> and then I've tested Bitwarden as well. LastPass is probably the slickest UI out of all of them, but it also, for me, is probably a little bit more on the buggy side. From a usability standpoint, there are certain sites that every now and then it wouldn't fill in correctly or it wouldn't populate correctly if you try to populate a secret and then save it to the vault it would be buggy that way or it would save multiple times with one password the ui isn't the slickest but i would say from a usability standpoint it has been rock solid i haven't had any issues filling in passwords or populating them or st storing them bitwarden i haven't used as much it seems fine the ui is roughly about the same as 1Password. It is fairly rudimentary, utilitarian. So, you know, my advice would be to try them out. Because Bitwarden and LastPass have free tiers, you can use them. And then again, they have that import function. So if you want to switch from one to another, you can do that. With 1Password, it is paid only, but they provide a free trial. So you can try it out, I think, for two weeks or a month or something like that for free with their premium versions. And then if you don't like it, you can still export those to a different vault as well. And what, a couple of just add-ons. I, I also am a 1Password user. We had Tanya Jenka on the show a couple of weeks ago. She's a 1Password user, although she said part of her reason for supporting them is because they're Canadian. So uh, tip of the hat to our neighbors to the north. Uh, the New York Times, their site, The Wirecutter, which is a recommendations site, uh, does recommend 1Password as their password manager of choice, but they acknowledge that they're all very good. And... Um, uh, yeah, I'm. Oh, I remember the other thing I was going to add on was one password in particular has this perception that it's Apple centric because it did grow up on the Macintosh and, and on iOS in particular. They've been around since the really early days of the iPhone, but they're honestly a great cross platform product. I, I obviously I work for Microsoft, and so I spend the majority of my day on Windows 10 on, on my Surface Book, and the One Password app for Windows is very solid as well. It even supports things like Windows Hello for unlocking the vault, which is really neat. So uh, definitely, um, they're all great products. And, and like Andy said, uh, two of them have a free tier, so there's nothing stopping you from trying them out and getting your hands on all of them. And and one password is a free trial, so you know we don't we don't want to make too strong a recommendation here, but um, at the same time, you know you can kind of tell where our heart lies a little bit too. You might ask why you should go with a password vault, right? Because a lot of users just use their browser as a password manager. This happens a lot at enterprises. It happens a lot. Uh, 
in per the personal life. But I think for me, like the point that Adam pointed out was you can use these cross platform, including mobile. So one of the things that browser password vaults can't do is have those on your mobile devices. One of the things we, we didn't mention is Apple Keychain, which if you're an Apple centric person, the Apple Keychain actually has a really nice password vault as well. It works very well if you're Apple only. But with these password vaults, they work on browsers, on any operating system, they work on iOS, they work on Android. And then if you do the enterprise versions of them, you have some control over how your users are creating passwords, how they're storing them. I don't know specifically the enterprise versions for 1Password or for Bitwarden, but for LastPass, I can force users to reset their master password if they put stuff in stored in, sh in shared folders, I would have access to that as an administrator if I enabled that, as well as I can force anything created with an email associated with my company to be stored within the master password, within the company vault. So there's a little bit of control. They don't really let you see individual secrets. So for any users who may think that if I store this within a company vault, then my company is going to be able to see it. It's only within shared folders for LastPass, at least. So you're not able to see it if they store it, even in, within their personal vault for the company. I know from 1Password, I have shared vaults where I give them out to like my kids or my wife. And anything within a shared vault, you know, whoever's added as a user within the shared vault can see it. But even for my wife or for my kids, the secrets that they store within their private vault, I can't see it, even though I'm like the administrator for our family. Andy, you made uh, a point in the sh in, in our in our show notes, like the show notes we use to do the show, um, where you talked about enterprises should disable password sync in the browser because that could allow enterprise passwords to leak outside the organization. So, you know, you probably wouldn't be really comfortable with all of your passwords synchronizing to Google. And if you have people using Chrome in your organization, that's probably happening. Um, so that's a, a good pitch to disable that um, on the Mac, disable that in Safari on you know, on Chrome or whatever. Uh, one interesting thing to note that is kind of a recent development is the Edge browser, which is now based on Chromium, does support password sync for Azure AD accounts, so for work accounts. Um, that might be a, again, it's not going to be as good as a password vaulting solution, but at least if you want to give your users some sort of password sync across browsers and devices in their enterprise that at least keeps it tied into your enterprise identity and doesn't allow it to wander off. So that's that's potentially an option to kind of, as opposed to just taking it away from your users and not giving them a credible alternative, uh, a way you can still deliver that if, if you use the current uh, Edge browser. So that's one option, but do a password manager instead. Yeah, the Chrome browser is probably one of my greatest fears and keeps me up at night because Google is notorious for wanting all the information, right? And mm -hmm. if you have Chrome and you sign into any Google service, which there are quite a few users out there who have Gmail, if you check your Gmail on your personal computer, if you sign into Google Drive, it will automatically sign you in to that Chrome browser therefore syncing all the things, your browser history, your password vault. And, you know, if that warning comes up and says, hey, would you like to store this or save this password? And you hit yes, and they're on their work computer, and then they go home, it'll sync across the device, and it'll be on their home computer. And so that is probably one of the things that keeps me up at night because it's super easy to siphon off enterprise credentials that way. Right, exactly. I had mentioned this on a previous show as well. 
a lot of people always ask me how secure, how do I create a secure master password? And the tip that I usually give to most casual users or people who aren't in cybersecurity, or even if you are, I tell them to think of a password that they use if I were to tell them to create a secure password. Most of us, when we say secure password, you have one in mind that you like to use, maybe for your bank or for your email or something that is more secure than the one that you'd use for like Pizza Hut. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you right now, if you think about it in your head, yeah. right? If I, you, if I told you to make a password, most of us probably would have a different password for a bank than we would for, you know, Kohl's or Best Buy or something like that. Jimmy John's, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So take that secure password that you think of and then just double it. Type it in twice because length is better than complexity. So the longer it is, the harder it is to brute force. So just take that super secure password, which my guess is for most people is between 10 to maybe 13 characters. And if you double it, all of a sudden you're at 20 to 26 characters and that is a nice secure password. Mm -hmm. I know there are a lot of paranoid people out there too, as far as using a password vault, a lot of security professionals or people who are, are privacy advocates may have second thoughts about putting all of their passwords in one place but I would want to ask them if they think that is riskier than reusing your passwords because I think the human brain can only remember so many passwords. So would it be riskier to put multiple passwords in one place and protect it with a super secure password versus reusing those and just storing them in your head? I, I can answer that one. I, I, I know the answer to that one because I, I, I will I will admit to guilt here. Um, before I was in any sort of information security role, so I will preface it with that. I had a pretty secure password, but I reused it all the time for all of the things. And I assumed naively that sites did, and I didn't even know what it was called at the time. I understand today it's hashing and salting. I assume they hashed and salted their passwords so that if you if a site got knocked off, people couldn't just go steal your password and reuse it. Well, of course, it, it turns out that a lot of these websites have terrible password storage and password hygiene, and they store it in plain text or all sorts of crazy gross stuff, reversible hashes or whatever. And your password is floating around the dark web in plain text. And people do love to take that and attempt to stuff it in other sites and see where they can get to. And I was victim of that. I did get credential stuffed a couple of times and it highlighted to me that, hey, this password's really secure. It's long, it's complex, it's all these good things, but you reuse it, it will get stolen from a site eventually that has poor security and they and these attackers will go stuff at a bunch of places they will try that for sure so it, it's it's not a you know a theoretical question i i can tell you i was the victim of it and luckily nothing bad happened i mean like somebody broke into my yahoo account and said a bunch of spam like who cares but it was still kind of eye-opening for me that okay this is a real thing this isn't just people wagging their finger and lecturing you on this is this is something that can really happen and i think that was actually the impetus for me to say okay it's time to use a password manager and have a unique password for every site because it is so comforting that when a site gets knocked over, you're like, oh, yeah, uh, Twitter passwords were potentially compromised, you know, 15 months ago or whatever. And you go, it's it's a unique password just for that site. They can steal it all they want. They can't use it anywhere. It's no good. That's that's a pretty comforting feeling. So I, 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 I don't I don't get that mindset at all because you are dealing with the limits of, of the human comprehension, the human brain and what it can store. Exactly. Another thing that I think is a misconception of password vaults is people think that if the vendor gets hacked, then all of their secrets will get stolen. And I just want to kind of knock down that misconception because 
all of these vendors store their your vault in an encrypted and salted and hashed method so that if they were to get compromised all the attackers would get is this encrypted blob all the decryption happens on the client side which means that they would have to compromise your device as we stated previously in this podcast episode if your physical device gets compromised i mean there's more to worry about there but if the vendor gets compromised all they're going to steal is this encrypted hash or in this encrypted blob and there are some concerns if we ever get to the point i know that there when i had attended a quantum computing conference that there are there's some concerns that people are stealing these encrypted blobs and then storing them and then later on years later when quantum computing is available they will go back and and crack these things very easily yeah i mean maybe if you're like elon musk or something like that they'll care about that but uh, you know for us normal folks we're probably not going to be targeted in that fashion so i would say the risk of a vendor getting compromised and stealing all your stuff is very very low to none it, it it's a weird thing how people have this selective belief in encryption when it suits their needs either either you understand that encryption is is a mathematical concept that is not really a matter of belief or not it's it is this complex with current compute it would take this long to brute force and break you can't selectively believe in encryption, yet I see people cherry pick this rather frequently. Um, I, I'll, I'll just give a, a totally other example, but kind of related. I had a customer tell me that they were concerned about the idea that with a BitLocker encrypted drive, that the physical drive could be removed from the device and then an offline attack could be attempted on it versus with a self-encrypting drive that's not an attack vector. And that is conceptually true, but there is no existing technology today to break into a BitLocker encrypted drive by brute force. It's not possible. And so this is the same sort of thing, right? If you steal those encrypted blobs from these services, which you know, you have to go through a lot of steps to get there. You still have this blob of nothing. And now you have to completely brute force it and break into it. That tech just doesn't exist today. And so it's one of those things again, and, and I sound like I'm getting on my soapbox a little bit, but you see like selective belief in encryption where it's like, oh yeah, you know, my FaceTime call is end and encrypted that's great nobody can eavesdrop on that but then it's like oh but what if somebody decrypts my password vault it's like it's, it's all the same thing here we're working with the same concept if you believe encryption is that failable then you shouldn't do anything on the internet i hope you've never made any purchase ever i hope you've never sent your credit card over it i hope you've never sent anything sensitive ever because like you can't have selective belief that it works here but not here you know what I mean? Like, yep. it, I, I always find that so interesting. Um, if you really want to be tinfoil hat about encryption, there's not a lot you can do. Let's just put it that way. Yep. I want to give an, my final tip, which is, you know, once you get to the point of using a password vault, maybe like you can get to this standard where I have a custom domain and I have a catch-all email. And so... For every single one of my sites, I not only have a unique password, but I also have a unique email. So if they steal that combination of the password and the username, they're going to get a unique username and a unique password because you can put anything in front of my domain like garbage at andyjaw.com or something like that. It will get sent to me. But as far as a login, it's a unique login because it's a unique email address. And then the other thing that I do which is convenient for password vaults because most of these will have a note section for each website or secret that you put in there. A lot of sites have these security questions. What's your least favorite food or what is your the street that you grew up on? I'll just generate a random string and put that in there as the as the answer. So I'll record the question 
something like food so that next time it pops up you know it'll be like least favorite food but i just put like food and then the random string of garbage that i put in there same thing with uh like even i think my cell phone provider when they ask you what your voice code is right that you have to say something i put that in there as well it's just a random string the first the last time i called t-mobile they said hey what's your phone password and i had to look it up in my password vault and i just gave them this random string some some sites also allow you to generate a a username just a, a regular username that's not an email i'll use a random string for that as well so once you get to the point of using a password vault you can do all those different things and that just makes it more unique makes it more secure so if you start populating your vault and you start changing certain things those are like extra tips to help you get to an even more secure state i i just want to plus one on a couple of those before we wrap up number one security questions are terrible please don't put real data in them if you can at all avoid it unless it genuinely is something that somebody couldn't look up like if it's something that nobody would know is not out there in public records, then maybe it's okay. But like anything that's public records, mother's made a name, like, no, don't, don't do it. And he's got a great point. You have a password vault in front of you. It's really good at generating random stuff. So use it. Um, and then another tip on that, that email thing, Andy mentioned he has a custom domain. You don't have to have a custom domain to do this though. Uh, Gmail accounts have supported since like the beginning of time that you can take your email address and do plus like the plus sign and then you can append any random string you want and they will accept it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great way if you want to try to track like if you think this site's going to sell your email, you can do John Doe plus crappy site at gmail.com and it will accept that. It'll still come to John Doe at gmail.com. Um, and I believe, if I recall correctly, Office 365 email addresses just started supporting that too. Um, but I'm not clear on the details, so don't quote me on that. But those are two really, really good tips, Andy, before we wrap the show. So the last thing I'll say before we wrap up is if you're an enterprise, we had mentioned this as part of our episode with Tanya Jenka as well. If you're an enterprise, you should be providing your employees with a password vault. It should just be a cost of doing business. And it isn't just a thing where you toss out there. There is some time that has to be invested to educate folks. Like I said, password vaults are difficult to use for people who haven't used them before. And it takes repetition. It takes time. It takes education. So make sure that you have training sessions for them videos made up demonstrations screenshots that sort of stuff documentation and every single one of these sites have very good documentation on the sites themselves that you can reuse and for your training i know for LastPass they have videos already made up on how to use it so provide your employees with a password vault and then educate them on how to use it and hopefully it translates over to their personal life as well And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. If you have a security topic that you want us to talk about or have further comments on the episode today, our contact information will be in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.